Hello, Connecticut, and welcome to the Paid Leave Podcast. The title uh, basically says it all. I'm Nancy Barrow, and I will be delving into this new state program and how it can help you and your family. This podcast will give you information you should know about Connecticut Paid Leave and maybe just a little bit more. Connecticut Paid Leave brings peace of mind to your home, family, and workplace. Welcome to the Paid Leave Podcast. Hi, and thanks for listening. We're talking about foster care. And under Connecticut Paid Leave, if you qualify, you can get up to 12 weeks of income replacement for bonding leave if you're adding to your family by birth, fostering, or adoption. And bonding leave is available only to the parent of the child. However, parent in quotations means biological, adopted, or foster parent, step parent, person standing in loco parentis to a child, or a person who is legal guardian or has custody of a child. And joining me for this conversation today, Natalia Liriano, the director of the foster care division with DCF. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Oh, so nice to have you. Jessica Holmes uh, is a licensed uh, as a relative caregiver and now has guardianship. Thanks for being here. And you've been in the biz for a while, so (laughs) you know all about DCF. And Antonio Eason, a foster parent and works in foster care. So nice to see you again. Nice to see you again as well. Let's start with you. Tell me your story, Antonio. How did you get into being a foster parent? Uh, It was actually by chance. Uh, It was during work at a previous employer. And this was several years ago, sitting at a table where they present youth that are looking for placement. Just happened to be at a round table and this youth came through and they're reading, you know, the profile of the youth. And I'm sitting there going, you know what, this uh, this kid could probably live in my house, you know. And then I accidentally said that out loud. And you used your out loud voice. I did. And I did. Um, <laughs> at the time, there were, I think, 13 or 14 of us there. And I was the only male in the room. And I've, I've noticed for me uh, and people out there who's probably listening or whatever, if you know me, I'm very – outspoken. I'm very upfront, very clear, transparent about a lot of things. And I made a reference about, well, this kid can come and live in my house. You know, um, we're two guys that are in a committed relationship and we were thinking about doing it. And all the ladies at the table said, you know what, we all were looking for LGBT parents where you guys would be great. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, we're moving too fast, you know, and it's just, happening. yeah, just out of laughs. I was like, you know, what? I'm going to call my husband. I'm going to call him now and just see what he says. And I didn't have my phone on speaker, but I was just, you know, Hey, there's, there's a kid, they're looking to place and you know, it, they're questioning who they may be. We're open. We're a great, um, what do you think? And he said, Sure, let's give it a shot. I said, no, you weren't <laughs> supposed to say that that loud. They could all hear you. And they were like, so. Yeah, they started asking questions. They are like, put it on speakerphone. They started asking questions. And my poor guy is like, uh, yeah, he's answering all these questions very truthfully because he right. doesn't know what's going on. And I was like, we're in it. Now we are in it. And sure enough, it moved very fast. From that point on, it moved very fast and went through the training, which I was – not too enthusiastic about because I was a trainer at the time. Oh, so you could have trained yourself. I could have trained myself and my (laughs) partner. And they were like, no, you have to do the (laughs) trainings, which was on a Saturday. It was good to see the training from... A different perspective. Yes, from a different perspective of somebody training me, even though I was well-versed in it, just to hear other people's opinions, their thoughts, their ideas. And, you know, it was good for me to support my partner at the time, who's now my husband, but it was good to support him at the time. And walk him through what this is going to look like. You know, um, I was so conditioned at that point of being in the foster care realm that I knew what it entailed. Right. He did not, you know, so. But did that help you at all to deal with, because, you know, when the kids go through DCF, as you all well know, the kids have some kind of trauma. Yes. You know, yeah. something, you know, with their parents went wrong, and that's why they're in the system. So did all that training help you? It helped me be able to, one, help the kid, obviously, but also help him navigate what that was going to look like. And, you know, as we go a little bit further through this or whatever, I'll tell you how our placement ended and the feelings that he carried with him. Right. Again, I'm in this business. I know what it all looks like. But to go through it, it's very different. It's totally different. And then I have to support a partner in that who comes from a very great household himself, um, grew up very well, um, 
to not have that background of what trauma informed care really looks like besides training. Um, it was hard. It was very hard for him to when that ended, you know, um, but it was a great it's a, it's a great experience. And I think every kid, no matter where they come from, they deserve a chance to be a kid. Yeah. And for our our kid, they didn't have that opportunity from six through 16. They were in care. So you got a 16 year old. Our kid was 16. Wow. And it's important to be seen as a kid. Absolutely. And th- that I think that's the other piece. They are children. Yep. And our kid didn't have that opportunity. And so before we were placed, um, they asked, well, are you OK if this kid, you know, hasn't officially come out, but they're exploring their gender and uh, and presenting as a female? I'm going, I dress great and I like to shop. So this is a great this opportunity. Might work out. Wow. Right. You know I mean? I was like, this is a great opportunity. Match made in heaven. Yeah, not not for us to spoil a kid, but to show a kid what a family unit looks like. And at that time, um the, it was again considered non traditional, you know, two males, two females, trans, what however you were, you know, identifying, if you weren't a male and a female, it wasn't necessarily looked at as traditional. You know? Um mm-hmm. So we wanted this kid to be exposed to what it's going to look like, one, in an interracial home, two males, two very extreme family backgrounds of me coming from an African-American perspective, him coming from a Caucasian perspective from, like, upstate New York. Now we're going to take in a kid who's questioning who they are in general, just broadly questioning who they were. So we were okay with that. Yeah. So, Natalia, how do you deal with kids who have gender identity issues? Because it's it's more common now than ever. Yeah, it's again, a child is a child is a child. And, you know, from the department's perspective, that is not if a child comes into care, you know, hopefully, you know, the parents that we look for, right, to be licensed caregivers are parents who are going to see that child as a child child. and walk alongside them as they explore, as they, you know, not to, again, discipline, boundaries, important Mm -hmm. Right. Structure. Important. But there are certain things that a child has to go through and has to explore with the safety net of a parent kind of saying, I'm here. I got you. Go ahead. Do it in safe to provide that safe environment, Um, because we do. We do have that. A child who is exploring whether, you know, I play a violin or whether I do basketball. That is a choice that they have to make. You know, whether I date this person or that person. That is a choice. Whether I go to this college or that college, that is a choice. So if they're exploring their sexuality, and it may not be for every single parent. Right. Mm-hmm. That's that's my question. How do you find the right parents? Like, do you have enough, like, banks of, of no. parents? Do you no. Have no. no, you don't. Okay. No. Okay. no. no. That's, <laughs> that's why we're here, Nancy. That's right. But there are, um, thanks, there are special Elliot. trainings for workers. Um Yes. Specifically for that demographic about, you know, yes. kids that are, you yeah. know, on that on the LGBT spectrum. And they Absolutely. work really well with the caregivers to kind of you know, go over a lot of the differences. Right. So, you know, in terms of becoming a licensed caregiver, there is a pre-licensing process that you go through. Right. So there's training. If there is a child who may require more or if you say... I'm willing, but I don't know, then it's our responsibility as an agency to make sure that you get whatever information you need in order to do that. So do we have enough foster parents? No, we don't. I don't think we'll ever have enough foster parents, to be honest with you. No, we don't. Um, And and we were talking before that, you know, most people want like the baby, right? Like the baby with, you know. Less than five. Right. Less than five. The children that we have difficulty placing are the children who have maybe that are older, the teens, right? Because that is an interesting age group. I I don't think I liked myself as a teenager. So imagine? Yeah. So imagine imagine being in care and not having traditional family background or I don't want to say values, but you know, traditional family leanings. Right. And you're in care and you're a teenager and now all of a sudden... You know. Being in the system must be hard as a teenager. And Imagine then, you're and, separated. You're separated from your family. 
you're separated from your family. And again, I, I, you know, for that child, my mom is my mom. My dad is my dad. And regardless of what they may have done, and you don't know, like a child's perception of what's going on around them sometimes is not, you know. It, a reality. A reality. You know, they may be thinking it's their fault if if I had not said something. So, I mean, that's one of the pieces that the parent that comes into for licensing has to understand that they're, you know, a child has their mind and they may be seeing things. Um, we never, ever, ever want to vilify mom and dad. Oh, no. Because they the, the, the whole process is reunification, right? Amen. Right? So you Say want to that get them again. Back, so you Reunification. The goal, right. yes. That yeah, is the goal. The goal, right. the, the goal is, you know, to support mom and dad while they're getting whatever it is that they need to get, letting them know that they, their child is somewhere safe, mm-hmm. uh, that they are able to connect with that parent because it's a co-parenting you know, proposition here. So we're hoping that the caregiver, whoever comes to be licensed, understands that that child needs that connection to their mom and dad. So that's an understanding as they go into being a foster parent. Yes, we stress that. Okay. And even now, that's one of the major initiatives that we are we are trying to, you know, just just kind of embed in everything that we do, you know, with we have an initiative, Quality Parenting Initiative, which is, you know, the the concept of the quality care for a child comes when all of the needs of that child is met, Mm -hmm. especially understanding that they need connection to their mom and dad. Yeah. Right. That they need that connection, that that doesn't go away. Jessica, why don't you just mm-hmm. sort of tell your story since I think it's so much different than Antonio's. Right. Yeah. So my, I'm the eldest of six kids. My sister directly underneath me had a brain injury when she was a baby. She was in a coma. So she has developmental issues, um, delays. She's about, she's about 36, but mentally she's about 12. So uh, 11 years ago, she got pregnant because her hormones are still her hormones. Adult. Yeah. <laughs> so she got pregnant, but she's under DDS care. So we knew when we found out she was pregnant, she wasn't going to be able to keep the baby. The first plan was for my mother to take the baby. She went through the process. DCF said she was not licensable for several reasons. One, because when my sister was a baby, she was removed from care due to the Whatever. circumstances surrounding oh. her brain injury. Yeah. And mind you, that was about, it had happened about 30 Twenty something years ago, at that time, so that was when it what the mm-hmm. DCF was not right. advanced mm-hmm. as they right. Are. So no, they right. they mm-hmm. were not willing to license my mother, and for you know some other reasons. So literally, as my sister's pushing the baby, I, I'm like, I don't want her to go into foster care. I'll take her. And at that time, I had my biological son was one and a half. He was four months premature, so he had a lot of medical issues, a lot of health issues that I was struggling dealing with, single parent, but I'm like, I don't want my niece in foster care. So I decided to, you know, to take her. The department actually helped with helping me to get into a bigger apartment so that I was able to have both kids, you know, with enough space. They helped with buying everything she needed, crib, uh, car seat, clothes, all that stuff. So they did help a lot initially, I didn't know DCF did that. Oh, they do. A lot of workers don't know DCF does that. I did not uh, know that. I know they do just because <laughs> I work in the field. Mm-hmm. Trust me. The DCF culture has gotten a lot right. better. From Absolutely. someone who's worked with mm-hmm. a lot of regions in the department, right. the culture has gotten a lot better. Right. So, you know, they did help with a lot of those things initially. The licensing process was very, very, very invasive because at that time I had not worked um, with DCF, you know, at that point. Um, It was very invasive, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, So I want to say maybe a year after I got my niece, I started working for the department. I was Natalia's secretary. Oh, that's (laughs) so cool. Um, I can say, you know, the first year or two was very, very difficult because there were a lot of things that presented itself that I was not prepared for and that I don't think families are usually prepared for. A lot of the underlying issues within the family come up when... Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you have authority over this child that's really this person's biologically. You have everybody with their opinions about who should be doing what. You know, she should be able to go see her mom without you having to intervene. And we don't understand why you have to, you know, have this level of oversight. And 
you know, you should be letting her visit with her more when, you know, mm-hmm. I have two kids now. I don't want to have a house full of people three, four right. days a week. You know, I'm trying to set new boundaries with my niece who's now, you know, going to I'm going to be her permanent you know, caregiver. It was known at the time this was going to be permanent. There was, you know, reunification wasn't a goal because my sister is not able to parent. Right, of course. Know. And then add to that DCF. Right. DCF and, you know. All of their many workers. Yes. You know, you have the foster care worker, you have the <laughs> CPS worker, you have the visitation staff, because at that time yeah. there was agencies yeah. that were yeah. supervising visits. Then you I have my sister's DDS staff. Right. Then the child's attorney, my sister's attorney. Is that attorney. like every week that they come? Yeah, twice a week. It just became a lot of stress and there was nobody in my family that understood what was going on because all they saw is DCF is paying you to, to have her. So you're good. Oh, you're uh, solid. The, right. the money. The, yeah. The like money part you're getting paid it. to have her. So you don't need help with and that baby. Not, you know, when that right. baby needs something, you know, you don't need any help because DCF is paying you. And they're not knowing that at one point I had called her worker and was like, y'all could come take this check and this baby. Cause this is a lot. <laughs> ah, the- <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't take any more. <laughs> right. I was Antonio like, if y'all don't knows. do something, yeah, yeah. y'all, I'm going to pack her stuff and y'all going to have to figure it out. Because it was a lot. Like, I was dealing uh-huh. with my son's medical issues. I was a single parent. I was working all day. And then I have, you know, Ooh, who other... took care of you? Nobody. There we go. Oh, that's, <laughs> there that's we the go. most important right. question for foster parents. So yeah. about a there year into go. it, I had to, I, that it put me in therapy because there was so much going on. Mm-hmm. And like I said, it triggered a lot of under underlying family stuff that kind of presented itself. So I ended up having to go into therapy because I felt guilty about not, you know, of course. allowing visits. Not, but that's you know, a lot for anybody yeah. to undertake, yeah. Jessica. I mean, I don't think... Is that something that now yeah, and, and DCF I, offers foster parents? Mm-hmm. And we are absolutely... We're not there 100% because I'm not going to sit here and say that we are just wonderful. We are wonderful, but we're working towards it. You know, right now we're actually working on what we call the kinship navigation model to help make sure that we have the right supports and and support as the caregiver defines support. Not as D- how DC right. defines right, support. Because right, right. they want to put in a lot of programs and, you know, we want you right. to do this and do this. Some of it is like, this is overkill at this point. This is right. making it harder. This is what I need, not mm-hmm. what you're offering. And I, and I do want to make the, the distinction between a relative caregiver and that fictive kin mm-hmm. and a core. A licensed, like a regular, you know, parent who fosters, a caregiver, they say, I want to be this, right? So they have the time to go through the training, sure, the right. 10 weeks, yep. the study, the, you know. Prepare so their it's, house, prepare, prepare their, their money, home. Right. And, mm-hmm. you know, so they're, they are consciously making a decision right. and following through and the ready. process. And they right. are ready. With relatives, it's this is what's going on. This baby needs to come with you today. Right. Today. So right. let me give you an example. Last night, nine o'clock at night, okay, we call great grandparents last night to say, hmm, you know, 18 month old and four year old are coming into care. Do you, can you, do you right now, right this second, we need a decision. And how old are the great grandparents? Oh, they're like in their seventies, right? So, so we don't discriminate in age. Nope. Oh, you don't? Right. Okay, okay. No, but we no. Wanna, we will support. However, we will support. It will take to support right. this process, right? So you know, and again, you know, because I want to make sure we don't care your sexual orientation, whether you are a two parent household, whether you're single, whether a parent is a parent is a parent. Right. This is called the Connecticut Paid Leave Podcast. So I wanted to just say um, to both of you, if you were fostering when you first got your kids, would 12 weeks of income replacement have Abs- helped? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because my, yeah, my employer was not thrilled with the idea of me taking a child. Like, that was actual conversations that I had to have. I was working at a law firm. And the attorney that I worked for was, like, not happy with it because, you know, you just had your son. You know, he has medical issues. You just take a lot of time off, you know, for him. I was the first person that applied for FMLA at that law firm ever. They never had anybody apply for they FMLA. They didn't know what they were doing. They, they, they were did like, not know uh, what they were doing. Uh, and FMLA is off different because it only gives you your job back. Right. right. But even with paid leave yeah. gives you income replacement for 12 weeks. Exactly. Right. So they were Imagine. not familiar with, you know, someone needed to take time off. I was fortunate because I worked at an agency 
um, again, doing this work. And it would have been helpful for me to take the leave and be paid. I was also in grad school at the time. You know, so I am now taking in a kid. I'm in grad school and I'm working. You know, my other half works. Their job wasn't as flexible as mine was. You know, so um, if this was uh, able to to be afforded to us back then, it would have really have made a big difference. It would allow caregivers have, to have some stress-free time yes. to, you know, it's, you know create stress. those, new, those boundaries with that new child in the it. home. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's having the bonding leave because right. that's what it is. It's bonding with mm-hmm. that, that new adopted right. kid or foster kid. To so figure kid out all birth. these new things. Let me figure out what daycare they're going to go to. Absolutely. Let me get their room together. Let me get their clothes. Let me get what they need. Let me go to school and meet their teachers. And that's the key for relative caregivers because, remember, we're calling you right on the now spot. on the spot and, and imagine if yeah. you have to reorganize your whole entire right. life to receive right so it's a beautiful thing but you know what does that do if with this program that at least protects your job and then right. gives you an opportunity to adjust to right. what's happening yeah. right? right that gives you time to be you know with the intrusive DCF process right, right. right. Uh, just the peace of mind of less right. stress right yeah. and what time do, do you usually ask families like do you have time off when you no, give them a you have to kid? figure it out you know and that is actually part of the um what we do is a home assessment when we come so for example last night there was a worker out in the home with his paternal great grandparents right and they're asking them, okay, let's walk through what would this look like like okay, so do you work because if you're receiving two below underneath five right uh, zero to five kids. That that's different. Can you sleep? You know, yeah. so you have to walk through what are the needs at that time in order to be able to support. So imagine being able to have something like this and say, "Let me help you with this," and maybe that could alleviate that concern. Because again, if I'm a breadwinner, you know, now I have. Imagine you have three kids, and now I'm going to add a couple of more. I, I, I need time to figure that out. And that could help take away some of that animosity between the caregiver and that bio Absolutely. Because you're going to feel like this is your fault. You know, you're yeah. impacting yeah. my home, yeah. my job, all, you know, because now yeah. I have to take your kid. But if there was some level of reprieve where, okay, we can do this and have a little bit of time and, to figure things out. Right. And not feel like your job would be... Right, Right, because FMLA protects your job. We give you income replacement, which is the key part. And you take both together, so your job's going to come back. Right. But you're getting some money now because FMLA never gave you money. They just gave you your job back. So this is like a brand new program since January. But I think one of the things, if you can think about when you had your your son, um, wouldn't it have been great if you could have taken 12 weeks off just to bond with him? (laughs) Yeah. Yes. You know, that's until until you're like eight weeks in and you're like, all this baby's doing is crying. No, I need a break. You know what I mean? She needs sleep. Yeah. And, I, and, I'm, only, and, I'm, only saying, and, I, and I'm only saying that because my best friend right now has a newborn. And that was the thing. Anne Marie cried old. all night. So there's a lot of different foster cares, right? Like, yes. So, for example, we were talking about parents who are custodians or guardians. So how many different types of foster care is there in those instances? Okay, so there is one license in the state of Connecticut, one license for to provide foster care. That's it. Oh, it's There's just one license. one license. Okay. Under that license, there are several types. You can be a kin. A relative caregiver. A relative caregiver. Which is what you are. Yes. 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 A relative okay. caregiver so that you can be licensed for that. Okay. You can be fictive kin, which means we're not blood related, but I'm your, you know, I'm your godmother or that auntie that, you know, yep. you know, that's yeah, someone that knows the child. That's sort of right. like right. Rel- uh, the affinity. Like a, right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Exactly. There is core, like foster care, you know, um, under that there is therapeutic foster care which is what i was uh, which yeah. is what antonia right. is and therapeutic foster care is a higher level because the children may have more complex needs that may require a more um skilled more sk- more intervention um a- adoption or pre-adopted so you can become licensed as a pre-adoptive right. family mm-hmm. um 
so those are the five overall five categories. Did I get them all? Yeah. Yep. Court, yes, yes. Um, oh, there is <laughs> um, interstate, com- interstate yep. compact. So we uh, there we have it in interstate compact office. So those are children who are out of state, but their relative is in Connecticut. We license them so that that child can come oh, into gotcha. the mm-hmm. state. Gotcha. So we refer to that as independent um, licensing. Or interstate, right. Right, interstate compact placement agreement. What advice, Natalia, would you give prospective first-time foster parents? Um, First time, find your tribe. Mm, Support is key. Find your tribe. Uh, You know, and again, I'm going to go back to being a parent is hard. Yeah. You know, so as as a as me as a mom, I found my tribe to help me because there are certain things that you can see that I can't see. There are certain places where I need a place to vent. You can take me off the ledge, right? Um and just someone just to hear me out. So for a perspective, you know, if anybody is interested in doing it, come because we need you, right? Um but definitely we will help identify folks, you know, to help connect you with other foster parents or who are in the same so that you would have a tribe of folks. But that is important. You need to have that support system in place um, and be willing to laugh, be willing to laugh and not take it so seriously. Yeah, um, absolutely. Not it, it, not that it isn't serious, but again, don't yep. personalize because it's so not about you. Yeah. It's so not about you. Um, and to be able to see beyond, I think, and, you know. Um, Interesting that you said laughter because I think that's so the best medicine. Oh, oh my Absolutely. God. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so the laughter was important, but family, family ties were super important as and well. The, another piece is make sure to use your voice, you know, again, and I am because of the narrative that DCF has. Yes. And, oh, my God, it's the government. They're just here to take away my kids. You know, we welcome the feedback. We welcome the good, bad and the ugly because we're not going to change if there is silence. Absolutely. I, I can't change something. If I don't know that it is impacting you, I, I, I cannot read your mind. So if you come as and, and I respect you as a partner. So if you are a licensed caregiver for the department, you are a partner in this work. So you're helping us with the reunification. You're helping us right with guardianship and adoption. So why wouldn't you a be at the table B, when you're at the table, why wouldn't I want to hear your voice? Absolutely. I can definitely pride myself that in a lot of the initiatives that we have going on, we ask care. That's why it was important for me today to have caregivers at the table because yeah. I don't live it as intimately. And there are going to be as nuances. Does, yeah. Right. And, and there's Antonio. Exactly. Right. There are nuances about this work that I'm not going to understand, but I am also willing to hear and to be able to reflect on, hmm, I need to think about that. Hmm. Yeah. And I can say the department has been doing a much better job of of prioritizing the voices of people that are actually doing it. Because before it, it, it wasn't. wasn't. Our deputy commissioner, you know, deputy commissioner Michael Williams, mm-hmm. deputy commissioner Jody Hill Lilly, and of course, um, Commissioner Durantes. And even Chief for Child Welfare. Even the chief, my She's boss, Tina Jefferson. The, has done the work, yeah. Tina Jefferson, I mean, and, and I'm, I'll say this, Tina Jefferson is a relative mm-hmm. caregiver. So, you know, so therefore they pride themselves on making sure that we have the parents voice at the table. They pride themselves on having community at the table. We're not 100 percent there yet, but we are definitely leadership is an amazing team. They really are. Right. They really, really are. Yeah. I'm very proud to work at DC. Oh, that's so good. That's great. Oh, Natalia yeah. Liriano, the Director of Foster Care Division of DCF, thank you for being here. Thank if you. someone does want to be a foster parent, where can they get in touch with you? one eight 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 kid hero And Jessica Holmes, licensed as a relative caregiver and now guardian. Yeah. Thank you for what you do, and thank you for lending such a different perspective. Thank you for having me. Uh, I got educated today. I really yeah. <laughs> got educated today on your, oh, sto- on your story. So thank yeah. you. And Antonio Eason, what can I say about you? Former foster parent <laughs> who works in foster care. So nice to see you again. And you're just 
so charismatic. I just love thank, you. Thank you. You need to get so another quiet. kid in, in your, in uh, your care. Uh, I'm running out of here because I have a feeling that I'm going to be stopped <laughs> in a second. But uh, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for all thank being you. on this podcast. Thank you for doing this. Yes. yes. Thank you for lending us an opportunity to bring this out to the community because I think it needs to be heard. So I appreciate you, Nancy. Thank you so much. I do, too. Thank you. For information on Connecticut Paid Leave, Fostering, and Adoption Benefits, please go to ctpaidleave.org. This has been another edition of the Paid Leave Podcast. Please like and subscribe so you'll be notified about new podcasts that become available. Connecticut Paid Leave is a public act with a personal purpose. I'm Nancy Barrow, and thanks for listening.